Jordan Bannister clung to his AFL dream for the best part of 10 years, racking up 67 games at Essendon and Carlton before it was all over. He quickly revived the dream by turning to umpiring, a transition no self-respecting AFL player would have contemplated in the old days. Was it a difficult decision, Jordan? Yeah, it was, Mike. Uh, probably, obviously, not the most commonly thing a player would do, but, um, you know, it just wanted to take up a new challenge and, and something that uh, was a lot different. How long had it been in your head? Um, probably when I actually started AFL, I, I started noticing umpires and, um, you know, chatted to them on the planes interstate and um, kind of developed a bit of a rapport with them. And, uh, um, yes, yeah, so it was always... Yeah, the seed was definitely in my head from the start. In some ways, you're almost the villain turned policeman, aren't you? I mean, your yep. your latter years uh, as a player. I mean, I know you ran with um, yeah. Chad Corns, um, Brad Johnson, Buckley, yep. Nathan, a yep. couple of others of that ilk, Ben Cousins. Yeah. But in the finish, you were very physical, weren't you? Yeah, uh, I suppose I was just getting frustrated with my body, and um, you know, my last year of VFL, AFL football, I was in the in the twos a little bit. You know, I was probably sniping a lot and um, doing things I wasn't proud of, and um, Probably then I knew I needed to do something different and, and make a change. You got reported. Was, who'd you get reported for whacking? Uh, I actually got reported for striking Tom Lynch, from yep. um, who's now at the Adelaide Crows. Um, yeah, and did something you know in that game that I probably wasn't proud of. And my best mate, who was coaching David Teague, actually kind of pulled me pulled me aside at the end of the match, and you know we had a really honest conversation, which I think I needed. And the conversation went how? Um, he just said, mate, you know, you're embarrassing uh, the younger guys. Um, you know, you should be one of the leaders of this team. And, um, you know, you, and, you know, he'd seen kind of what had happened in that game. And, and you, you know, my actually younger brother was playing in the same team. So I was kind of letting a lot of people down. What did you do to Tommy Lynch? <laughs> um, not real proud of it. Um, yeah, kind of was in a pack and um, dropped a knee in his head and um, knocked him out, mm. um, which was a... Was it deliberate? Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, he kind of said a few things to me and, and I just was frustrated, um, stupid, and really apologised for, for what I did. And, you know, he went off the ground and then came back on in the last quarter and was obviously disappointed in what I did and fired up at me and then kind of lashed out him again and then got reported then, which um, well, I thoroughly deserved. And um, So you were yeah. angry, were you? I was frustrated. I was, mm. um, you know, my body wasn't holding up to what I want to do and I wanted to be an AFL footballer and you know I'm in the twos and not getting a kick mm. um, so it's frustrating and um, you know I just took out my frustrations which was you know you can show a lot of empathy now as an umpire for players though because I know what they're, they're going through mm. um, in that scenario but um, you know I'm just glad David Teague pulled me aside mm. and was able to fix it up. So what about now in the interaction that you've got with players I mean you have got the player mentality still haven't you because you know you wanted to be a player you were a player for a 10 year period. Yeah. Your kindred spirits, in a way, the players and, and you? Yeah, look, you know, we bump into them at airports, in the hotel rooms, and, you know, I still get along with a lot of blokes at a lot of different clubs. And, um, but the, the AFL umpiring environment is, is not really different to a, a football club environment. You know, you have your, your larrikins, you have mm. your nerds, you have all types of guys. You know, I've been overseas with guys from both areas, and you'd be very surprised of how, how good a bloke some umpires are and, you know, they, the teamwork, the leadership. You know, I know it sounds like a bit of a crock talking about leadership, but... <laughs> On a big MCG game with 80,000 people, if we're not switched on, and you don't have strong leaders in the umpiring, you know we're gonna we're gonna stuff it up completely and be on the in the front of the papers tomorrow. Mm. So there's a duty of care there that we need strong leaders in in umpiring. When you go into the Carlton rooms, given your history, is that difficult? Yeah, it is very difficult. Um, I actually don't like going in that room. Um, it's um, you know I have some great mates there. Had been on footy trips with you know had some funny stories with and you know now I'm in charge of umpiring them. Mm. It's um, and I've got to call them by their first name. You know I've never called Andrew Walker Andrew <laughs> in my whole life. Um, so it's really awkward when I have to call him Andrew. Well, you're a bit on good terms there, mate. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, I lived with Andrew for a couple of years in, in Coburg and um, lived with his brother Ben and, you know, he's a cracking fella and, um, oh, probably the best two years of my life. So, yeah, it's hard to look back on that. So if he doesn't get a free that he thinks is his and you're the officiating umpire, yep. do you get an earful from him? No, not too much. Um, none of the Carlton boys or Essendon boys have ever really really given it to me on field. Um, you know, I, before, the room, before the game, it's awkward in the rooms, but once we're on field... You know, they've got a job to do, they're switched on, they don't even really look around once a decision's paid. Um, you know, you've got to move on to the next contest. So it's pretty rare that you, you get that time to really have a go at each other. You've still got the player mentality to some extent, though, haven't you? You haven't paid one fifty metre 
yep. for descent since you've been umpiring? Yeah, no, I haven't paid an abuse 50 metre penalty yet, which has been good. Um, you know, in saying that, I'm probably going to cop a, a huge year for this week. <laughs> um, but um, no, look, I think they, uh, you know, maybe empathise that I've you know played before. You know, um, obviously there's a lot for me to still learn from the umpires, but I think my playing background kind of helps a little bit with communicating my decisions. Mm, um, mm. You know, just the way, you know, they're obviously fired up. You know, they listen to pump-up music before the game. They're boxing on the pads. So they're in a completely different mentality to us as umpires. We're calm before a game. So when they fire up after a decision, I've got to understand I'm in a different mindset to these guys and give them a little bit of space. Um, so I think it's just understanding that environment. Talking about decisions, now we're not going to make this the old world of sport. <laughs> What's your decision? But I want to show you a decision. <laughs> I want to show you a decision you paid in a St Kilda game. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sean Dempster has the footy at uh, half back. Let's have a look at it here, and yep. you can uh, you can take us through it. There's Dempster. Yep. Kicks the ball the best part of sixty. Yeah. It bounces thirty metres inside the boundary line, and trickles over. And umpire Bannister is seen running in. <laughs> <laughs> and paying the inevitable deliberate decision. You wouldn't have been comfortable with that, would you? So that's when I'm running in there thinking, oh, the crowd's going to give it to me here because I'm definitely paying it. Um, you know, he's kicked it a long way, so in my heart it's probably saying, you know, it's very stiff to be deliberate. But the way we're coached is Dempster's got it at about centre-half back. It goes out of bounds. So if you draw a straight line from there, it's gone on an angle to the boundary line. So in summing that up in my intention, there's no players in the area. He's deliberately kicked it in that direction, which is where the boundary line is, so we've got to be firm on it, deliberate out of bounds. Um, in saying that, it's gone a very long way and it's bounced a lot, mm -hmm. so I can see why people you know, are cracking it over that. But how, how would you have copped it? If you put yourself in Sean Dempster's situation, would you have thought that was unfair or would you say, that's what I intended to do and he's called me on it? At the time, I would have been angry. Mm, and mm. Um, I reckon later on, though, when we do our coaching, I probably would have understood why... I'm sorry, Sean, I'm hoping <laughs> you, you understood why I unfortunately paid it. Now, and again, this is the last one on the umpiring. Yeah, yeah. The prior opportunity, to me, it's become a blood sport. Bloke wins the footy and he gets this infinitesimal amount of time to decide what's the best for his team and what to do with the footy. Yeah, it's a tough one. Probably last year, you know, we were coached to earn on giving them a lot more prior opportunity um, they prob than they probably deserved. Um, I think this year it's been a lot better. Um, you know, supporters are obviously, the feedback's been that we've been better um, at being shorter on the prior opportunity. But I think, we're, as I agree with you, you've got to be mindful of the guy that gets the ball, giving him an, uh, you know, a couple of seconds to make a decision. We don't just want someone getting the ball slammed, hold, you know, and we're paying holding the ball because you'd pay 400 a game. Um, so it's just getting the balance. And I, I think this year, um, coached by Hayden, which he's been excellent. Hayden Kennedy. Hayden's yep. been brilliant. Yep. Um, just very honest, very flexible, um, you know, and he's coached us really well. I think we're getting a lot of them, or most of them, right. How do you judge your form? Do, do, you, do you rely entirely on what Wayne Campbell and Hayden Kennedy tell you, or do you know, like when you do as a yep. player, you know when you come off how you've gone? We have a panel of coaches. Um, so we have a coach designated to each game. After each game, I'll sit down, go through every single decision, mm. whether it's correct, unwarranted, or missed free kick. Um, then we'll look at other things like bouncing, work rate, teamwork, communication, you know, um, you know, if you're calling players by the wrong names, etc. Um, so we get a mark at the end of each game. So pretty much at the end of each season, the guys with the best marks will do finals. Um, and, and that's how it works. What about when you make a decision that you know in your own mind is a howler? Oh, it's how shocking. Do you, how do you process that? Yep. And, and is it a simple matter of sort of saying, look, I may have got that one wrong, I've got to put it out of my head? So definitely communicating with players first is the best way to do it. So you don't want to get in their face and say, you clearly did this. You know, you want to say, this is how I saw it. And I want to get that message out first of all. Um, but you know in your heart when you've made a mistake. Mm -hmm. You know, I paid a soft in the back against Robert Murphy a couple of years ago, gave Ryan O'Keefe a shot on goal. I'm setting up the mark, feeling shocking, you know. And I felt it all week and felt terrible and it actually affected me in the next week. But now, kind of three years in, they don't affect me because I know if I let it get to me, it's going to affect the next contest. Um, so you've really just got to be mentally tough to block it out and not let it affect you. Did Murph... Murph is known to open his mouth a bit oh, on the footy field. Did he say he anything to you? He gave it to me. Did he? Um, and then I went up to him later in the game and kind of apologised and he said, oh, mate, don't worry about it, I make mm. mistakes as well. But at the time, you know, it's a passionate game and he, was, he had every right to. Now, you and Lee Fisher are yep. both ex-players who are, in a sense, blazing the trail for 
AFL footballers who might go into umpiring post their footy careers. Yeah. You've spoken to Andrew Carazzo about uh, perhaps that being the next phase of his footy life? Yeah, we, um, I'm really good mates with Andy and we met at the start of the year just as mates and um, he made it really clear that his f focus was football. Um, but, you know, we've always spoke about my umpiring and, you know, he just asked a lot about it. So, uh, you know, we, we arranged a meeting just to have a sit down and have just a bit of a chat about it if, you know, if he did finish up, you know, if he'd like to, to get into it. And um, personally, I think Andy would make a fantastic umpire, you know, to get someone who's involved in a leadership group, one of best and fairest, and just a hard-nosed kind of, you know, hard-working player, I think it'd be fantastic for our umpiring group to get him. You approached Jeffy Garlett, didn't you, about a, a career in umpiring post-footy? Yeah. Um, look, when I have a chat to, you know, mates at the airports, um, you know, I usually bring up umpiring and kind of spread the message a little bit. But, um, look, I, I think it'd be fantastic if we got an indig Indigenous umpire um, as well as a female umpire and good mates with Jeffy Garlett. So um, the airport at Alice Springs the other, uh, the other day, I just mentioned to him, said, look, Jeffy, uh, you know, obviously he's got a lot of years left in his mm. footy. But I said, you know, post-footy, uh, what an Indigenous umpire would, would do to the game. I just said, look, just, just have a think about it. Um, you know, he's obviously got the attributes, he's fit enough mm. and quick enough. Uh, so I think, yeah, he'd be fantastic. What did he say? Uh, he kind of laughed. <laughs> so it's the first time he'd, he'd heard this. Oh, yeah, and I, I, I bring it up to a lot of people. Um, yeah, because you, you were sort of unofficially the ambassador, right, too, between, or the link between the player group and, and the umpires. Yeah, well, I, I think the AFL gave me a great opportunity um, and I kind of think I owe it to them to kind of get as many people involved as possible. I think it helps kids at local levels want to want to take it up. So you're one of three now, one of three umpires. Is three enough? I mean, the one area that I think as a spectator, yeah. we're facing players who clearly throw the footy, but yep. they've got their back to the umpire, so it's not easily seen. Do we need a fourth umpire? Yeah, I think people bang on about going full-time and things like that, but I think something that would is a lot better than going full-time would be to have four umpires in a game. Um, I think it's a lot cheaper to do that as well, a lot more cost productive. And But I just think when, it, when a pack turns um, and you're behind it and you've got another umpire out on that, on that side, we trialled it in the NAB Cup and it worked really well. Um, so hopefully we can get it next year. I think it would just service the game more than anything. Let's go back to your playing career. What, yep. what, how do you see it in retrospect? I mean, it was always a struggle for you, wasn't it? Essendon drafted you. Yep. You played 14, dozen or yeah. 14 games there. Yep. Yeah, and then yeah. on to Carlton. Yeah, I got the... Um, boot on my 21st birthday from Essendon. Yeah, yeah, Sheedy sacked me on my 21st, um, which I probably had it coming. You know, I think I was soft um, uh, physically and mentally. And um, Before I, you leave that, yep. soft physically and mentally, you are Wayne Bannister's son, are you not? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those of us who remember your father as a boxer and, and know that he played pretty hard brand of footy yeah. would be surprised to hear that. Yeah, I just think... Um, I, I lacked confidence. I, I went down there and I was in awe of Matthew Lloyd and James Hurd and I didn't think I belonged there. And in the VFL, I was hard at it. In the AFL, I'd step up and I just was like, you know, a deer in headlights. Mm. I just didn't belong, didn't felt like I belong and, um, and played accordingly. Yep. So got the boot on my 21st birthday and cancelled my birthday party. Did and you? I was, oh, I was yeah. shattered. Yeah. Um, yeah, cried for a little bit. And then yeah. um, Dennis Pagan rang my, my manager and asked me to come down and train um, the very next Monday. So, you know, a few days later, I'm, I'm, I'm training at Carlton, which was, was, was very strange. Because Car that was the year that Carlton made 15 changes to their list. They Remember did. that? Yeah, 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 it was a huge influx. It was, um, you know, it's where I met David Teague and Andrew Walker was drafted mm. that year, and it was a completely different environment stepping in out of Essendon, which had this strong leadership and playing in grand finals into Carlton that were pretty much at rock bottom. Was um, you know I saw it as an opportunity though I saw it as you know of, 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 of a way to get a game and kind of make a career. We'll get back to Dennis shortly, but I want to yeah. just before you leave the Eston situation, did Kevin Sheedy tell you face to face? How, how did you get the sack? So um, I got the sack from Dennis, uh, from Sheedy in a, in a room with the football manager Dom Cato, and it was a bit of a surprise. You know I, I probably didn't really expect to be sacked on that day, mm. um, but when he told me, I just remember. Um, sweating up so much that when I left the room there was like a metal door handle I couldn't open mm -hmm. so Sheedy actually had to get up and open the door for me which is um, pretty embarrassing you know I've just got the boot and then couldn't open the door. Look the Kevin I know was a caring individual particularly yeah. younger, younger people was he soft with you or was it just that you uh, haven't cut it on your bike? No he was pretty matter of fact yeah. um, I don't particularly think he liked having those conversations um, and I was obviously upset but I think he had to really get the message probably clear and he probably wanted to move on with the meeting, you know, didn't want it to drag on and 
yeah, so I remember Lee walking out the door and thinking, what the hell has just happened? Mm. Um, went home, told mum and dad, and it was just shattered. And that's the reality of what AFL is about for some people. When we come back, let's talk about your relationship with Dennis Pagan and its bizarre end. Yeah. So Dennis throws you a lifeline. Yep. There's an interesting sequel to that, isn't it? He revived your career <laughs> and then he ended your career, didn't he? Yes, in Tell some ways. Tell us about this, this Brisbane game, Jordan, when you were playing... The Blues are playing Brisbane. Yeah, so um, obviously I've been in and out of the, the team and Dennis had been under the pump that year and um, we got slaughtered up at the Gabba one day and um, you know, I think Jonathan Brown kicked 10 goals and um, me and me and Dennis had a, an interesting conversation at half-time of that game where... He told me straight face to face that I was pretty much done and that was my career done and go out and enjoy the second half and <laughs> yeah. Of course you would. Yeah, yeah. So this is 2007. Yep. yep. Half time and he says, son, that's it. After today it's over for you. Yeah, Dennis um, was a very honest man and at the time a lot, you know, people might have disliked him for his hard approach but looking back on it, Dennis has had the most positive influence of me as a person out of any coach I've ever had and... I love what he's done for me, pretty much. Um, you know, it's helped me be a stronger person. But he told me at halftime in that game that you've had enough chances now, son. That'll be your last one. Go out and enjoy the second half. You, that's done. Um, which which really rattled me, and because um, I knew Dennis was a man of his word. Mm. Um, and luckily enough, um, something happened two days or oh, a day later, and 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 Dennis got the sack. Interesting sequel, wasn't it? That you're finished. Well, you. He to all intents and purposes, you're done. Yep. And then on the Tuesday after the Sunday game, Dennis gets the boot. Yeah. Brett Ratton comes in and you get another crack. Yeah, Rats straight away came up to me because he had heard what had happened and, and a few of the boys had too and had kind of got around me and said, mate, I'm going to play you every game for the rest of the season. Mm. And um, the confidence that gave me. You know, when you played, you could come off and you could have a good game. You, you've, you've got a role, you perform it well, you're happy, you're proud, the team's yep. won. Can you get that same sort of satisfaction about umpiring a game? Um, it's a good question. Um, well, I found it weird coming off the ground early on. You know, you don't sing a song or you don't get around the boys. <laughs> you just yeah. kind of do the Brownlow votes and then nick off home and get on with your, your full-time job. So um, you definitely, it's definitely a good feeling when you umpire a big game and it's a pressurised game and you get the decisions right and service the game and you come off thinking, you know, I don't know if a lot of other people out there could, could do that role. Um, which is which is pretty much the satisfaction you get out of it, um, mm. but it's definitely a weird feeling. You talked about Brownlow votes. A lot of us on the outside have a lot of perceptions and misconceptions yep. about what happens with the Brownlow votes. The three umpires decide the votes, correct? Yeah, and with the emergency. With the umpire. emergency. Okay. Yep. Then you agree on those. They're put in the envelope. Yep. Is there any discussion? amongst you guys from there or your, your colleagues who have had other games about Brownlow votes? Yeah, so the first thing I learned when I got down to umpire training was the word Brownlow is taboo. We, we don't talk about it at all. Um, so much so that, yeah, I went out to training and was just, you know, in my first year and just kind of chatting about it and everyone just looks the other way. It's just they're, they're so keen on keeping the Brownlow votes to umpires that they would never put it in jeopardy and, and talk about it. Mm. Um, and I might only get, you know, a team four times a year, so I have no idea who's won the Brownlow because I don't talk to other umpires and, you know, I haven't done all other games. So, you know, we, we, we definitely respect that we got the right to give the votes and take it seriously. One other perception, real or fact or fiction, you guys don't see the stat sheets. Definitely don't see the stat sheets. Isn't um, that weird? If, if someone's getting junk footy, we won't notice it out there. Whereas yeah. if you see someone under packs breaking the lines like a, you know, a Travis Bogue, Fife kind of style of footy, then they, they come into your attention. So been saying that we're human so we do occasionally see stats mm. on the big screen so you know and do you look for them do you look up to see um who the stats say probably don't well? look for it but you know i'm having a drink at three quarter time and they come up yep. i'm gonna gonna look you say Jeff, i have that many yeah yeah, yeah. so because i remember i'm playing a footy, local footy game once and i thought a guy'd kick three or four goals and he'd kick 15 so <laughs> <laughs> we believe that yeah <laughs> <laughs> how did you interpret the will minson affair he gets four weeks for touching an umpire um, and then it's overturned and he's fine and he's allowed to play. That's a big swing, isn't it? Four weeks is yeah. a serious penalty yep. and then the penalty's removed. It's a tough question because, um, obviously because of my job. Um, we'll... Would you have reported that? Yes. You would have? Yeah, yeah. We, we have to. We get told okay. for umpire okay. contact. Um, mm -hmm. But Will is 
probably out of the AFL players, the, the best bloke to umpires and has so much respect for umpires, mm. it's not funny. He always talks to us, very courteous, um, you know, just really good bloke. Um, so, but I think a message needs to be sent to local footy that you cannot touch an umpire. Mm -hmm. Brendan Goddard wasn't happy with uh, some uh, audio effects that came across oh, yeah. on TV yeah. recently. Is it too intrusive to have you blokes mic'd up? Um, well, it helps us service the game. We communicate, the three of us, together, the umpires, the whole game. So, for example, if I'm balling a ball up here and I see two players kind of holding, I'll say to my other umpire, watch Ablett and uh, Crowley here. Oh, so you can talk to them on the, the whole as game. it happens? Okay. Um, so I think if we can give Ablett a free kick if he's being held yeah. and the guy from 50 metres away mightn't be looking at that contest until I tell him, um, you know, if it helps the game, which I think it does, and it helps us a lot communicating with each other, I think it's it's great. It's unfortunate what happened with Brendan. I, I totally get that. But I think generally before that incident happened, this really hadn't come on the radar. Um, so I think generally it's pretty pretty good. How's the sledging with you? Do you get sledged? By, do the players give you a bit of stick? Um, no, not, not too much. To get the best out of players, um, you know, you've got to talk to them, not talk down to them. And you, you don't want to apologise them all the time because I walk all over you. You've got to be firm mm. but friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the approach I, I take. I want to ask you about your late brother, Ricky. Uh, the first instance, what was his response when you told the family that you were going to become an umpire? Um, Rick was pretty surprised. Um, you know, Rick had, he was living on a farm. He was, he was a boxer. He was a, a hard-nosed guy and um, he kind of laughed. Um, <laughs> but then... And the more I spoke with him and kind of sat him down, he, he saw why I, why I was doing it and, and was kind of happy I did it. Shocking year for you, 2013, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, um, Ricky's uh, riding a horse? Yeah. What, what, did the horse spook, did it? Um, I think it might have been a bit fatigued. It was um, the end of one of his lessons. Um, he'd been about an hour into it and it clipped the top of a jump and, um, and nose dived and, and took Rick down with him. Mm. He became a quadriplegic instantly? Uh, yeah, he, he was put in, he, they placed him in a coma and um, he became a quadriplegic and um, he was unable to speak, eat or drink. Um, couldn't speak for about a month and couldn't eat and drink for the rest of his life. Wow. Oh. Yeah. I know it's tough for you. I just want to read, the, there was a really compelling story that you, you penned yep. um, at the time. And you say, this I'm reading from this story, I, as in you, yep. I umpired last week's Melbourne GWS game in a fog, a blur. Instead of being filled with adrenaline running out on the MCG, I felt weak, tired and burdened by an overwhelming sense of sadness. How can you perform your function when you're in that state? Um, you probably can't and, um, you know, I probably shouldn't have. Um, but Rick, yeah, came out of his coma and, and, and wanted me to umpire. He did, did he? Yeah, mm. yeah. So the only thing he could do at that point was speak? Yeah, he couldn't speak. He couldn't speak, so no, how, we had a, how did he convey we, that we had message? We had a message board where I'd point to letters and Rick would, would spell words out. And um, he was in ICU for about ten nights and I think I spent about seven of, them, of the nights with him. And, uh, yeah, we, we had some good conversations and, um, you know, I was just glad I got to spend that time with him. There's six, six children? Uh, yes, yeah, six. six mm. There was six of us. Um, three older brothers and a younger brother and sister. And he was, he was your older brother? He was. Yeah. And, um, you know, you grow up with... Um, I, I grew up in a bunk bed with Rick. Um, I was on the top bunk. And, uh, you know, it's just weird. It still doesn't feel real, honestly, Mike. Um, you know, it was only in September last year that mm. I've, I've lost a brother. It's, mm. uh, it just doesn't feel the same, and in some ways I feel like he's still on his farm and we just haven't chatted in a couple of couple of months. I remember reading that he was, in relative terms, better and seemed to be going as yep. well as you can go in that state. And yep. a week later, he's gone. What, what happened? Um, Rick, um, in the first year, really battled, you know. He um, lost so much weight and, um, you know, he, he just had a lot of anxiety and... and, body, and you know, his body image had changed and, um, you know, I think he mentally struggled with it a lot. You know, I remember he, some weeks he didn't want to go on. Um, and then, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you take that from your brother? You know, it's, it's your brother and he's telling you he doesn't want to go on. Um, and then watching the effect it had on mum, you know, the weight loss that she had and the stress and the, the fights it caused in our family. Um, everyone why, was... Why, why, why the fights? Because we're just on edge. Um, 
everyone's wanting to make the best decision for him and and make him get better and he's not getting better and you know we're just we're, we're fatigued and we're on edge and we clashed mm. and um and Rick Rick got to a stage where he was mentally probably accepted his condition um you know of being stuck in a bed for the rest of his life and not being able to eat or drink so you know we're we couldn't even have a drink in front of him without feeling guilty. And um, did you have a roster? Was it the family roster to sort of have someone by his side most of the time? Yeah, so we set up a roster with all our siblings and mum and dad that someone would be there every single night with him. Um, so that probably enabled us. That's probably why I got back in umpiring that I had kind of some from days spare now. Um, so I kind of spoke to Hayden and Hayden and Wayne Campbell were, were, they were so good to me to let me come back. Um, you know, I came back round five in an AFL season. Because you'd given it, you'd said you wanted, you'd retired, hadn't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I was having games where, you know, on a Friday night, Rick would be rushed to ICU and was fainting and vomiting everywhere, and we thought we we're going to lose him. And then I'm umpiring on a Sunday, mm. and something had to give, um, you know. And just, I didn't really have many, many friends, many best friends, because I had four brothers and, and a sister. So, you know, when you when your brother's going through that. It's, you know, it affects you. Like, I've changed as a person. I, I can't ha be as happy as I was. How do you experience the same happiness when mm. you see someone go through that? You know, they haven't just passed away. He's, he's been tortured for a year and a half, yeah. you know, mentally and physically. Um, so it was shocking. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Did Warwick Kappa went to see your brother, didn't he? Yeah, he was... How did um, that, that come about? Um, I contacted Warwick, um, obviously being a hero of Rick's. Um, absolute champion. Um, bloke Warwick was responded and, and came and saw Ricky in a hospital and spent a whole day with him and and two days Ricky had that were good in hospitals when he's when his when his son William was born mm -hmm. and when Warwick came and visited him you know he got a photo <laughs> uh, Warwick actually took a specky on top of top of Rick's wheelchair <laughs> did he because Rick asked him to and you know he had that picture in his room and Rick loved it so mm. yeah so that was one of the two best days of yeah, Rick's having, post the accident, having yeah. his little baby William and becoming yeah, a dad yeah, yeah, and, and Warwick. Yeah. Does your playing background help you with the crowd, do you think? Do you think, um, the, do you think the, the crowd understands that Jay Bannister, the umpire, is Jordan Bannister, the ex-player, and therefore he should know what's going on? Yeah, you cop it over the fence nearly at every ground you're at, but it's, it's done you know, in pretty good spirit. Um, but I, I think sometimes it helps and sometimes it doesn't. Um, you know, I probably stand out, that it's probably taller and bigger than most mm, umpires. Mm. But then sometimes it probably helps because, you know, they, they know I've played, so I think it probably balances up. And Jordan, it's a great story. We love it. I think it's really important for football in the broad sense and certainly for umpires. And you've brought some extra credibility there. And, and congratulations on what you've done and may you umpire many more good games. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Thanks, Mike. Mate. Thank you. Cheers. This has been a Fox Footy production. Part of the Fox Sports Network.